Okay. Welcome to the Birchinar tonight. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Josiah Madison, Alex Newman, Stuart Jones for being with us. Uh, for those that are part of this webinar, you can uh, ask a question by typing it in and then I will read it and I'll ask the people that we have on our panel to read it live. Uh, all four of us have one thing in common, actually two things in common, or well, maybe more than that. We're all millennials. So if, if you don't like yep. what's going on right now, I guess you can always blame the millennials, right? So everybody listening, right if, <laughs> if you're anti-millennial, all four of us are millennials. But, uh, but all four of us actually supported Ron Paul for president too. So anyways, there's more that we have in common, but we won't go into all of that. I don't want to bore everybody that's, that's listening here. Uh, but anyways, we'll get going here. Steve Hoffman, ask the question. Older people want to get out and about, but we must be responsible and careful in that the virus actually has a more potent effect on us than younger people. Wearing an N95 mask helps to protect us from getting the virus. But to try to find an N95 face mask, they are just not available. What can be done to increase the availability of these masks? Go ahead, uh, Josiah, you start us off. Well, my, uh, my first instinct would be to look at government regulations. Um, I do understand that one of the reasons why we have a deficiency of masks is because um, of how many regulations are on those masks, what's considered to be, um, you know, an acceptable uh, quality. Uh, I think there's been a, a diff uh, division between uh, masks that are available for use for hospitals versus in uh, construction or some of these different things. I think President Trump has taken some steps to to reduce some of those regulations so that those different masks that are considered uh, useful for different industries can actually all be used for medical care. Um, so I think that's one, one thing, but um, definitely would love to hear what other members of the panel have to say as well. But my instinct would be, let's look at and see if there's any ways that, that government is restricting use. First of all, see if the free market can handle it. Okay, go ahead, Alex Newman. Sure. Well, thank you. And, you know, I, I come across this a lot in my economics class. I teach advanced economics at the Freedom Project Academy. Economics is a passion of mine. And, uh, you know, I think Americans kind of get a kick out of making fun of Venezuela because they have you no know, toilet paper and things like, ha ha, we told you socialism wouldn't work. And yet I'm here in Florida right now. Every time a hurricane is heading for the state of Florida, we experience exactly the same thing as the Venezuelans experience on a daily basis. And we experience it for the exact same reason. Uh, in Venezuela, the government says evil capitalists are causing inflation by charging more than the fair price for some good or service. And therefore, we, the all wise and benevolent and uh, omnipotent government will determine what the appropriate price should be. So they say you can't sell toilet paper for more than, I don't know, say a thousand uh, bolivars or whatever. And what happens? It suddenly becomes unprofitable for merchants to create toilet paper, for suppliers to create toilet paper, for merchants to sell toilet paper. And so there is no toilet paper. And you know, when, when you're dealing with people who are not familiar with basic economics, they hear things like we shouldn't have price uh, gouging laws. They say, well, that's horrible. You just want poor people to have to pay more money to buy gasoline or, or uh, you know, plywood or toilet paper during an emergency. No, I, I'm not a horrible person and I don't want people to pay higher prices. What I do want is an efficient allocation of resources. Now, when, when the government says you can't price gouge on masks because that would be hoarding and that would be wrong and that's against the law, what happens? People go out and they say, oh, the masks are only 99 cents or $2 or 10, I don't know what they cost. I think I'll buy a thousand of them, right? And I'll just stockpile them in my basement and wait for the apocalypse. Whereas if price gouging so-called were allowed, uh, merchants would say, whoa, there's a huge demand for these masks. We better raise our prices so that we don't get sold out in the first five minutes and have an angry line of customers out around the block demanding face masks. Well, in the state of Florida, and my guess is South Carolina is probably the same, uh, you are not allowed to raise your prices in response to this dramatic increase in demand. So what you end up with is a shortage, a very dramatic shortage in the case of emergencies like what we're seeing now. 
So I would say the solution is to let the free market do uh, what the free market does best. And you know, it actually gets compounded. And I'll give another example from Florida. You know, when the government says you can't price gouge on plywood, on gasoline, on bottled water, what happens? There's a hurricane barreling towards Florida. Everybody out there is buying huge quantities of gasoline and plywood and water because it's so cheap, right? It's the same price as it was before the hurricane was coming. What do merchants in Georgia and Alabama and South Carolina say when they look at that? Hmm, I could risk my guys and I could risk my truck and I could risk my merchandise by sending it into a potential disaster zone and I'll earn exactly the same amount of money as I could make by selling it in Georgia or in Alabama or in South Carolina. Hmm, that's an interesting choice. I think I'll choose to sell my stuff right here. So if the prices were allowed to rise in response to the emergency situation, it would encourage more entrepreneurs to allocate more resources into the production and distribution of more masks. It would result in a more efficient allocation rather than a bunch of people hoarding them in their basement. Uh, people would buy what they need and allow others to purchase some. And yeah, poor people would have to pay a little bit more for a mask, but at least they would get a mask. So uh, that's my response. Uh, you know, without knowing the details of South Carolina legislation, we have that every year in Florida when a hurricane comes. So, All right, Representative Stuart Jones. Yeah, yeah, South Carolina, um, we have far too many regulations in South Carolina. And um, it, it was kind of funny because when I first started in the General Assembly, um, which I haven't even been in there very long, but when I first started, I couldn't get an answer on how many regulations do we actually have in South Carolina. Um, and it took some digging. Um, we had to work with uh, legislative council um, and research to actually find out how many do we actually have. And, um, you know, that number was, it's over 70,000 regulations in the state of South Carolina right now, 70,000. And um, so, you know, while I, I wasn't surprised because government is interfering every day in the lives of every business owner, of every individual, in all these uh, really unconstitutional um, and just terrible ways that they're interfering in our lives, um, I, I wasn't surprised that it was that many, unfortunately. But um, so South Carolina, like a lot of other states, we've got far too many uh, government regulations. Um, this whole situation that we're in right now, it really, uh, it begs the question, do we believe that individuals have a natural inherent ability, you know, a better ability to make their own decisions than a group of uh, central planners or people in government? And I believe they do. I, I have that confidence in people. And um, so, uh, but yeah, a, a free market economy is the best method to ensure that resources are properly allocated. And we've seen that in so many examples uh, during this crisis. Okay, now that we're, we're, we've gotten warmed up, I'm going to limit everybody to one minute in their answer, okay? Because we've got a bunch of questions. We're going to be done at 8 o'clock, okay? Great answers, though, everybody. I, I agree with all three of you. Ryan Thorne of Thorne Ambulance has a question. Are there, an, so he owns an ambulance service in, in the upstate of South Carolina. Here's his question. Are there any additional measures being considered at the state level to assist healthcare providers? Our business has experienced a 40% decrease since the start of this, but we have, we've, we have had to maintain staffing and pre preparation for this surge. I can repeat that. Are there any additional measures being considered at the state level to assist healthcare providers? Our business has experienced a 40% decrease since the start of this, but we have had to maintain staffing in pre preparation for the surge. Representative Josiah Magnuson, can you answer that? Yes, I, I can speak to it a little bit. And um, again, would love to hear what others have to say here, but um, what, what Alex and Stewart have to say, but uh, a couple of things. First of all, this, the legislature is not in session right now, so there's we're pretty limited on what we can do. Uh, unfortunately, um, we have to wait for the Speaker of the House, Jay Lucas, and the President of the Senate, Harvey Peeler, uh, to call us back into session. Um, now, what I would say is there's something the governor can do, which is he can go ahead and open back up uh, the ability for us to do elective surgeries and so forth, and allow for patients to get medical care. That's something that I'm hearing is that there's a lot of patients that do need care and are not being able to get it, um, whether they think they can't 
go to the doctor or whether in fact the, the regulations uh, don't allow them to go uh, right now and get care. So that's something we can do immediately and I would, I would love to see us do that immediately is allow for those elective surgeries, allow for the patients uh, to be able to, to get the, the medical attention that they need uh, and that they deserve. And then also I would say in the long term, um, one thing I think we need to do is repeal certificate of need laws. So certificate of need laws uh, keep us from uh, being able to uh, have hospitals open and compete on the free market. Uh, that was something that Governor McMaster actually did is he, he uh, suspended the certificate of need laws with the state of emergency. Um, and so that was wise. I'm, I'm thankful Time's he up. did, but, uh, but we need to do that permanently. Okay. Alex Newman. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not pr familiar with uh, South Carolina's particular situation as it relates to these things, but, you know, on anything to do with the economic front, when businesses are hurting, when people aren't getting the goods and services they need, when our, you know, when our people are losing their jobs, and it's the same thing is happening in Florida, you can almost always um, point to the government accurately and properly uh, as the source of the problem. Uh, free markets do much better. It's, it's a well-established truth. In fact, if you don't believe it, all you got to do is look around the world and uh, compare nations that have freer markets versus nations that have less free markets. And in fact, economists have done this. And what you find is that uh, economic freedom is directly correlated with prosperity. So if you want a prosperous economy, if you want your small businesses to do well, if you want your wages to increase, what you need is the government to get out of the way. The government shouldn't be telling us when and where we can get health care and all these rest of these things. And actually, I've heard uh, from here in Florida and other parts of the country that um, the hospitals are, uh, are, are having to lay people off and furlough people because they were anticipating this enormous influx of coronavirus patients that never came. So now they're sitting around uh, diddling their thumbs because there's no elective surgeries allowed. There's, you know, people are scared to go to the doctor. So as, as always, get the government out of the way and let people make their own decisions. Time's up. Stuart, same question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stuart, I think we're having an internet issue here. Okay, we've lost Stuart. Uh, maybe it's the Wi-Fi. So we'll, we'll, we'll move on here. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, okay, cool, cool. All right. Um, yes, I was just saying I agree with uh, Josiah and Alex very much. So um, certificate of need, uh, 100%. Um, one of the good things the governor did was suspending some of the licensing regulations for nurses and medical professionals. That, that's something I think we need to do um, when we're not in a crisis also. Um, but there's a lot of unintended consequences. These executive orders have been very uh, vague and have caused a lot of confusion. I received a call from a constituent who um, was just in a terrible situation because a doctor would not operate on somebody that initially had an elective surgery, um, but was in it needed emergency surgery at that point. And mm -hmm. I literally had to call the governor and threaten the doctor with um, the governor, you know, basically telling him that he, he was okay to do the surgery, to perform the surgery. So, um, yeah, the, the more regulations, the more of this it is not helping us. So, more freedom will help us. I hope that's the way that we can push the legislature once it convenes. Okay, thanks for answering that question. Um, we're going to go on to, um, let's see here, Ryan and Steve asked a number of questions. I'm going to move on to another question here. Um, Michael Lohr says, how has the SC governor, this, how has the South Carolina governor and legislator treated this shutdown? compared to Florida and some other states. What do you think of the governor of South Dakota and her position on shutting down her state? On, well, her position on not shutting down her state. That's, that's what the question should be here, so. Yeah. Go ahead, Representative Josiah Madison. Sure, so uh, thanks for that question. Um, great, great question. And uh, of course, the governor of South Dakota has, has, I think, done a phenomenal job of standing up to the pressure and, uh, whoops, sorry, standing up to the pressure and just making sure that, um, that people keep their fundamental rights. You know, I, I think that's a, that was a concern of mine from the beginning of this is that, um, that we were going to be doing damage, uh, not just to our economy, but, but to our fundamental liberties. And so 
I think the, the governor of South Dakota realizes that and has, has stood her ground, so I'm thankful for that. Um, now, Governor McMaster has, I think, been more balanced than what some of the states around here have been. Um, and so I'm thankful that, that he's maintained a little bit more of an even keel. Um, but, you know, we need to go ahead and start uh, reopening. Of course, we're starting to reopen, but we need to, to get the ball moving. Um, Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia has already, um, you know, got the plan in place to, to reopen the state of Georgia. And uh, Governor McMaster now, I think, needs to, to step up to the plate and, uh, and follow suit on that. Okay, time up. Alex, can you answer that the best you can? Can you hear me, Alex? Yes, I yes. can. Sorry, I, I had to unmute my mic. Uh, great question. Thank you very much. I, I sure appreciate the governor of South Dakota. Um, you know, I, I think the, the Florida governor kind of reluctantly uh, ordered a half-hearted shutdown, and I think it was mostly political concerns. You know, it, it, for those of you who still watch the fake media, and I don't recommend it, uh, but if you have been watching the fake media, you see it's never ending. Oh, my goodness, the Florida governor is so irresponsible. How could he not shut it down? New York shut it down. So I, I think it was partly a response to all that pressure. He didn't want to look bad. He didn't want to lose the next election. And so I understand where he was coming from. I still think he made a bad decision by uh, doing what he did. I think the South Carolina or South Dakota <clears throat> governor made a much better decision. There were several others as well. Um, I believe there was four or maybe even five Republican governors that refused to shut down their states. They said, hey. We're free people. You guys all have common sense. Use your brains, right? God gave you a brain for a reason. Don't do something stupid. And you know, if you're old and, and you have diabetes and you're obese, you probably ought to try to take steps to isolate yourself. But if you're young and you're healthy and you need to go out and run your business, then go do that. That's absolutely common sense. That's what people should do. Time's up. Okay, Representative Stuart Jones. Yeah, absolutely. That was, that was right on, Alex. Um, really comes down to the confidence that we have in people to make their own decisions their own inherent ability to use their god-given mind um and, and that's what it comes down to and i applaud the governors who have um have restrained government um and, I, and while i know uh henry mcmaster i i got off the phone i called him about an hour ago and i am literally almost daily calling him and begging him to um to lift these restrictions on salons and gyms and restaurants and um you know, really, I mean, have faith in the people of South Carolina. Um, they need to take precautions. I mean, and I believe that they're the best ones to decide how to do those things. Government can make recommendations, but um, it should never shut down somebody's livelihood, shut down somebody's business, um, or infringe on their liberty. Thank you, Stuart. You were right on time. You're the first, first one to do that, Stuart, so... Way to go. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> you cool. win the prize. Cool. What's the lucky prize right now? Okay. We'll keep going here. Um, <laughs> what is the plan for Friday's Drive to Thrive event in South Carolina? I know Alex Newman, you may not. Um, I, so this is a good question. A lot of people are going to go to a rally in South Carolina. How effective are these rallies? And, and do you support these rallies? And, and are there ways for us to be more effective? Representative Josiah Magnuson, go ahead. Sure. I'm going to be brief and uh, say the answer. I think probably Stuart may know more than I do about this, but um, I mean, sure. Yes. I support the rally. Uh, I sent out an email a few moments ago uh, to my constituents, um, which uh, mentioned the, the drive-in rally. Um, I, I don't really recommend that anybody get out and do an in-person rally right now, but I think the, the driving around uh, the state house is going to be very effective. I think it was in Michigan. So um, so yes, I, I support it. Um, Friday the 24th is my understanding at noon. Okay. Uh, is okay. when it's scheduled. Very good. Alex, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I'm very supportive of these rallies to, uh, to liberate our states as president Donald Trump put it. Uh, you know, I, I think the governors and, and the little local tyrants that want to arrest pastors and shut down our business and tell us that most of us are unessential, right. Coming from bureaucrats. I mean, talk about unessential. Uh, it's outrageous. It's crazy. And I think unless and until people speak out loudly, forcefully, respectfully, and legally, uh, these people are going to continue steamrolling over our rights. So I think we need to put up a show of resistance. We need to do it publicly. I know the JBS has never been big on in-person protests and rallies, partly because the left can manipulate those and do false flags and things. But I do think it's important for people to go out, show their support for, for reopening our states, opening up our economies again. <clears throat> uh, I think it's a good move. Thank you, Alex. Go ahead, Stuart. Yes. Yeah. Our freedom to assemble is essential. Absolutely. 
And um, I support, yeah, the Drive to Thrive was the first idea um, that's being pulled together by a number of um, uh, activists. A number of people are putting that together and there should be a lot of cars. Um, they're gonna be beeping their horn for one minute at 1230 on Friday around the state house. And um, I told Henry McMaster a little while ago, I told him that's what we're gonna do. And um, I'm trying to, trying to show him, you know, I mean, this is, this is a time where you really separate the people who really believe in our liberty, um, who believe that it's God given, who believe in the free market and the people in the market. This is a time that really separates those people from our fair, fair weather constitutionalist. You know what I'm saying? So, um, that event Friday, uh, absolutely. I'm going to be there in my car. And I know there's a couple of, there's a couple of different events going on. I think there's going to be, um, some people that are going to be speaking out there and, um, you know, and, and that's completely their right to do that. So, um, yes, I support it a hundred percent. Thank you, Stuart. And Eva just commented, she said, you guys are nailing it. So anyways, you get, you guys have a fan out there. Next question. Uh, Janice wrote this specifically for Alex. Uh, what similarities do you see between what the Nazis did in using medical crisis with tuberculosis to restrict freedoms and isolate certain populations to what is being done with this globalist pandemic? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the uh, National Socialist exploitation of a health issue to advance tyranny. But uh, what I think is very clear is that governments all around the world, including totalitarian governments, are using this crisis and hyping this crisis for the purpose of stealing liberty. Uh, it's not happening just in the United States. It's happening worldwide. Uh, globalists and deep staters have been thinking through this for at least a decade, probably much longer. Uh, there's a Rockefeller Foundation report that I have on the future of technology and international development, such an innocuous title, where they talk about uh, you know, four different scenarios that would help move us closer to this little new world order they're building. And uh, one of them is called lockstep. And they talk about how this pandemic could be used to shut down countries, shut down economies, steal individual liberties. Uh, we're seeing that happening in China. We're seeing totalitarian governments do it. And uh, we're seeing, unfortunately, a lot of state and local governments doing that in the United States. So uh, we need to be very, very careful here. We need to recognize that tyrants can and do use any excuse that they can find as a pretext to steal our freedoms. And uh, we need to be very aware and we need to oppose those things. Okay. Josiah or Stuart, do either of you want to talk about that? It, it, it was directed towards Alex. So if, if you're okay with Alex's answer, we'll move on. I'll, I'll say one thing, which is that um, totalitarian governments have always historically used medical emergencies uh, to consolidate power. And so I think we do need to be very careful. Um, to, I think we need to be very careful right now. I think that, it, that the commenter makes a good point that, um, that whether it's National Socialists or whether it's the Soviet Union, um, even like mental, you know, you know, unstable mental people or whatever like there's a lot that that they use um from a medical standpoint to try to control the population for sure okay next question ed ed is asked are sc doctors south carolina doctors and pharmacies able to provide uh, hcq for patients outside of the hospital environment in new york cuomo has restricted use to critically ill previously tested positive or hospital hospitalized patients this has caused nursing home deaths and, and an inability to treat the virus early when symptoms occur. And HCQ is, is the popular um, drug, um, hydroxychloroquine. I'm still learning how to pronounce it. I'm not a medical doctor or pharmacist. So hydroxychloroquine, could any of you answer that question for South Carolina, Josiah or Stewart? Can you, um, I'm not sure if I understand the question completely. Are they he's, asking? He's wondering, he's wondering if doctors and pharmacies, <clears throat> doctors can prescribe HCQ for patients outside of the hospital environment. So let's say somebody comes down with a fever and, you know, the symptoms, they're not sure. getting it until they're hospitalized. Whereas uh, an American should be able to get that drug whenever he or she wants it if, if they're sick, you know. But anyways, what are your thoughts on that? So. Well, and, and my wife is a pharmacist, so she has explained to me a little bit about the hydroxychloroquine and how it is being handled right now. Um, basically, you can a doctor can prescribe you know whatever uh, drug he, he chooses, but there's a 
sometimes there's a limit on whether a pharmacy will even have it in stock and those kinds of things. Um, sometimes they have to put uh, a, a categorization on the drug on what it's going to be used for, what it was prescribed for. So there's certainly limits on the availability of of that drug right now. But um, but I think I think anybody is free to prescribe it if they choose to. That's my understanding. Okay, Alex, could you answer this question? Yeah, I don't know about South Carolina specifically, but uh, before we we began this call, I actually just finished interviewing uh, Dr. Carla Dean Graves, who's uh, working closely with the White House on a lot of these issues. Uh, she actually was the one who uh, who let them know about hydroxychloroquine uh, weeks before it was a topic of national conversation. There had been some studies done in other countries, and uh, one of the things she said to me was that it's outrageous and completely unacceptable that uh, federal policymakers at the FDA and the CDC are trying to limit um, hydroxychloroquine to people who are in hospitals. And she said that that needs to be overturned immediately. She's been trying to get the uh, Trump administration to, uh, to give that order. But the bureaucracies are apparently making it very difficult. Uh, you can get it for other, for, uh, other you know, issues that you might have. But my understanding, is, based on what Dr. Carla Dean Graves told me, is that uh, the FDA does not want that dispensed for uh, coronavirus outside of hospital settings. And so there's efforts now to, to get that overturned. And I think the real solution is what do we have an FDA for in the first place? What part of the constitution authorizes the existence of a food and drug administration that would get in between me and my doctor and the best medical treatment? It's, uh, it's crazy. And if people want to watch that video, it should be posted at the New Americans YouTube channel uh, by tomorrow. The, the name is Dr. Carla Dean Graves, uh, amazing lady. And she's really up to speed on all this stuff with hydroxychloroquine, the different treatments that are available. I know CNN just put out a hit piece now saying that it's no good for anything, but that obviously is a choice that should be made by patients and their doctors, not the FDA. Okay. For identifying an organization that should be eliminated, Alex, you won this free new magazine here. And so I'm going to send this to you in the mail. It's got some great articles in it. So um, New American Magazine, it's, it's, great art, it's a great magazine about the coronavirus. It's actually sold out, but you can get it for free online. Stuart, would you like to answer that same question? Yes. Yeah, real quickly. So I did read something earlier today that um, I believe MUSC in South Carolina is going to be um, taking part in a, uh, in a clinical trial for hydroxychloroquine. And, um, uh, but really, it comes down, you know, uh, LLR licensing in South Carolina and DHEC and um, there's there's so many regulations. DHEC has over 48,000 48, of the regulations in South Carolina are with DHEC alone. And so you got to think um, a lot of these drugs, I mean, people should have the ability to try these things um, at their will and, um, and we can uh, refer to the market for a lot of the studies and a lot of the health um, to help uh, market regulations. So, this this next one's a great question. Uh, Deborah says here the event business which I am in is destroyed. How and when can this industry come back when they are restricting how many people can congregate, weddings, parties, etc. Josiah, could you be the first to answer that? I think it's the same answer as um, as the other question about you know medical care. It's it's kind of in the governor's hands right now. Um, the legislature can't. We're not in session, you know. And until we come back into session, then you know the governor is going to have to lift those uh, state of emergency restrictions. And and I hope he does. I I think that um, you know I, I I really feel for so many of these industries that uh, that just can't you know, the, the owners of these businesses can't provide for their families right now. To me, that's the bottom line that, um, you know, they want to paint it as it's about the economy. Um, when I think in reality, it's about survival for so many of these folks. Alex, would you want to answer the same question? Yeah, uh, since I only have a minute, uh, I'll say if, if you guys don't have yet a copy of that uh, copy of the New American that uh, Evan just held up right now on uh, the coronavirus, I did a whole article in there about uh, the deep state's assault on the economy and economic freedom uh, stemming from the coronavirus. I encourage you to read it. Uh, it seems like there's a deliberate orchestrated effort by the deep state to bankrupt small businesses, to crush asset prices, to uh, consolidate control over economic activity in fewer and fewer hands. Uh, this is very, very dangerous, and uh, I think we need to get working on it now before the damage is irreversible and before it gets any worse. All right. Well, Stuart, would you want to answer the same question? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the current executive order is set to expire um, April 27th. And um, it really, it's a, it's a bad situation. Josiah and I both have asked, um, we've written letters, we've constantly asked um, even for the uh, General Assembly to convene, even for the uh, House Representatives to go into session to address some of these things. There's a lot of uncertainty and confusion that's being caused by these executive orders and um, putting businesses, families, um, your health, putting all those things in a, uh, in a bad situation. So um, ultimately, I believe that we've got to open it up. We've got to allow people to be responsible. Business owners um, have an ability, have the best ability to ensure the safety um, and the health of their patient, of their uh, clients, their customers, and their employees. And, um, and that's how they stay in business. And so um, that's going to be their concern, um, you know, so taking precautions and that kind of thing. Um, they're going to want to do that because they're going to want to stay in business. So I believe we've got to turn it over to the businesses, get the government out of the way. All right. Uh, one question came in from Karen Bracken. She, it's, it's a long question. So uh, she's concerned about vaccines. And vaccines seem, seem to be the cure, according to the uh, globalists that are trying to push these on us. And so they're preparing a coronavirus vaccine. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think South Carolinians should be taking this vaccine right when it comes out? Josiah, you're the first one up. Sure. So um, there's a lot of aspects to that question, but um, in simple terms, no, I, I'm very skeptical of um, any kind of uh, COVID-19 vaccination. I think uh, my understanding is that there's never been a successful um, vaccine for a coronavirus. The coronavirus is one of the main viruses that causes the common cold. And if we can cure COVID-19, then we could cure the common cold. But, um, you know, so if anybody comes out and says, well, you know, we've got this, this vaccine that cures COVID-19, um, I'm going to be very skeptical of that. And I'm also going to be very skeptical from the standpoint that, uh, you know, who knows, you know, what they're, what they're really pushing, you know, in that, uh, in that vaccine. And, um, and, and are we going to really give up our freedoms until that vaccine is developed, I think that's an even deeper question um, because, you know, I don't see that vaccine being developed in the near future. And I think that, um, you know, suspending liberty until such a point as we have that um, is uh, simply unacceptable. Okay. Thank you, Josiah. And, and, and Karen said here, my concern is with forced vaccines. That's, she wanted to make that comment here. Okay, okay, well, then, uh, well, I'm absolutely against uh, mandatory vaccination to begin with, so <laughs> we'll, we'll throw that out there, too. <laughs> okay, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, obviously, to begin with, a mandatory vaccine is unconscionable. It's insane. The government has no right to tell any person what they must inject or, or consume uh, as regards medicine or anything like that. And also parents are the primary decision makers for their children, not government. So, um, you know, the nature of mandatory vaccination in and of itself should be a red flag. If it's actually effective and if it actually works, people who take it have nothing to fear from people who don't. Absolutely nothing. And, um, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. I won't tell people they should or shouldn't take a vaccine. I'll tell you, I personally am extremely skeptical of vaccines. I was neutral on this issue until uh, back during the swine flu thing. This was just when I was starting off as a journalist. I just graduated from college and the editor of the New American called me and said, hey, look into this whole swine flu thing. Uh, I praise God that he did make that phone call. I spent a month investigating vaccines and came to the conclusion that they are not nearly as safe as we're being told. They are not nearly as effective as we are being told. Uh, they have very significant risks. And I personally am not willing to take those risks. If it comes to mandatory vaccination, that's going to be a very big problem. But uh, I also understand that a lot of these vaccines that are being developed by different companies on this coronavirus front, they're using uh, aborted babies. Uh, another reason why under no circumstances would I accept any vaccine made from uh, murder victims. And so I encourage everybody to do their own research, be very, very skeptical. And if the government tells you you must do something, uh, keep in mind, there is no liability for these vaccine manufacturers. If you die, if your children die, if you end up paralyzed, disabled, which is actually what happened during the last mandatory vaccinations during the 1970s swine flu hysteria, there is no remedy at all except a federal vaccine court where you'll be up against the federal government's lawyers and you'll have a maximum payout from taxpayers of $250,000. I'd be very skeptical. 
if you all can't tell, I, 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 I let Alex break the rules on time. So um, I'm sorry to the sorry. elected officials. You are politicians, so so Alex does get to break the rules. He's anyways. <laughs> we'll have some fun. Okay, I call we're, you guys statesmen. People discriminating against us in the state house. So <laughs> get to work. Why isn't the session? Why isn't the legislator meeting yet? Oh, anyways, I'll I'll, I'll I'll stop with my rant. Stuart, same question. Yes, I'll I'll make up for Alex. I'll actually be really fast here. So, um, yes, I, I am completely to echo Josiah and Alex completely against mandatory vaccinations. Um, and personally. I mean, I'll tell you, um, I'm for people being able to try stuff if they want to. I think it should be up to the individual parents, um, ultimately. But probably about 10 years ago was the last flu shot that I actually had. And I've never been that sick in all my life um, after that flu shot that I had. Probably it was about 10 years ago. So um, personally, I, I, don't, I don't do those shots. And I wouldn't, I've never never would support forcing anybody to do it. Okay, Bill has a question here. Why is every patient listed as COVID-19 patient if they have, if they go to the hospital and they're having trouble breathing, even if they are having a heart attack or maybe COPD? These are false numbers. Yep. That's his question. Josiah, mm -hmm. would you like to answer that? Hmm. I mean, I do have some thoughts on that. Um, I think I'm going to defer to Maybe to Alex on that you wanna, one. You want to give your 50 seconds to Alex? Okay. Sure. <laughs> well, you ahead, know, I, I will say that I've, I've spoken to a lot of medical doctors, medical professionals, nurses, doctors, uh, hospital workers uh, over the last few months in my capacity as a journalist. Um, my understanding is that the numbers of coronavirus deaths are being massively inflated. Uh, in fact, there was a state senator and a hospital doctor in uh, the state of Minnesota who blew the whistle. He got guidance from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services instructing him to list every death uh, that they suspected of as being coronavirus as being coronavirus, even if they didn't actually have a test to confirm that it was coronavirus. That is medical malpractice. That should not be happening. As I understand it, there's also a uh, financial incentive to list patients as coronavirus patients and deaths as coronavirus deaths because apparently the compensation rate is higher. Uh, this is unconscionable. And if you want to know more about the medical numbers, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, an expert in this field, but I did an hour long interview with uh, Dr. Shiva Ayaduri, who is, he's got, uh, you know, four degrees from MIT, including a PhD in biological engineering. Uh, and he broke down why you cannot trust the government's numbers on this at all. They're overinflating the number of coronavirus cases. Uh, and I think the, the incentive for doing that is obvious. They've shut down the whole economy. They've destroyed millions of people's lives. What if they say, oh, and we only had 10,000 deaths. That's less than the flu. Suddenly they look very, very bad. So uh, I'd be very suspicious of their numbers. And I think uh, there's good reason for that. Thank you, Alex. Stuart? Yep. Yeah, I'm very suspicious of them. Also, um, cases that I've seen. Um, in my local community, uh, people that had um, a, a lot of underlying issues um, that, uh, you know, are, are being the, the biggest victims of it from what we can see. So, um, and I've also seen the incentive, uh, them incentivizing uh, the hospitals and uh, the, just the medical realm in general around all things COVID. Um, there's people out there that aren't getting help for other things right now and um, people that need uh, medical attention. And um, so uh, I've heard some numbers that uh, $34,000 is one of the numbers that I've heard. And, and that'll have to be, somebody will have to verify that, but that um, hospitals, that's what they're getting for COVID patients, um, 34 grand. And so um, really at this point, yeah, it's been incentivized. Okay, we're done with the softball questions. The gloves are coming off. <laughs> Kim, Kim Fletter has a question. Public-private partnerships are being talk about, talked about by the president and many others in the news. Our state constitutions have been changed to include public-private partnerships called, quote, in, intergovernmental relations, end quote. My belief is that they started with Prince Charles when he created the Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum. This is the same method Rick Perry used for NAFTA when he, con when he contracted with a company from Spain, Centra, <laughs> giving them the tolls in Texas for 50 years. Are you as legislators familiar with their sovereignty destroying power and are you willing to expose them? Josiah. Well, um, 
once again, a, a very big question, but um, I, I think certainly I'm for, you know, government working with the private sector. And in my time as a legislature, um, you know, I've been able to find some ways that we can do that, where, where we can cover, you know, we have private groups cover parts of, of infrastructure projects and some things like that. But what we run the risk of with anything like a, a, a public-private partnership is crony capitalism. And I think a lot of times that's a code word for, for, um, for that, you know, crony relationship where somebody that's a politically favored uh, business or industry actually ends up getting, um, getting the contract. And often it's for, um, you know, as the comment or the questioner mentions, uh, often a hidden agenda, um, uh, whether it's the green agenda or whether it's other things like that. So yes, we have to be very careful um, and really dig into these before we um, before we go along with them, I think. Okay, Alex. Yeah, uh, I want to echo uh, what Representative Magnuson said. Uh, I, I think that's exactly right. You know, there there are times where it's appropriate for government to work with private business. I mean, could you imagine if the government were to actually go out and hire the individual workers <laughs> like the DMV, right? It would never get done. We'd all sit around and we'd never have a road. So there are times when it's appropriate to bring in a private company or a private contractor to do certain things. But there's also an enormous risk here. You know, uh, Mussolini defined fascism as the merger of state and corporate power. And there's a lot of globalists, including a lot of globalists at the United Nations, who are pushing this idea of private public public private partnerships, where uh, basically they will take taxpayer money, uh, send a bunch of it to their cronies enrich all their buddies and then put all the risks onto the backs of taxpayers while they do things that the private sector would never be willing to do uh, on its own because it's a stupid project. It's not something that individual people would be willing to pay for. So there's a very, very, very big risk there of blurring the lines between government and corporations. And we need to be very careful, even though there is a time and a place for government to use private companies to take care of certain things. Go ahead, Stuart. Yes. So the private sector, without a doubt, does things uh, more efficiently, more effectively um, than government, without a doubt. Um, and the problem, uh, though, is that government, basically what will happen sometimes um, in those partnerships is that these outside agencies or outside uh, partnerships will have autonomous boards. They will have um, basically unaccountable uh, bureaucracies, unaccountable uh, privatization is, is the problem. So it becomes a monopoly at that point. Um, the absolute best thing is when uh, the government can get out of the way and allow people as individuals to make their own decisions of who they're going to go with for a service. Um, so you got to be very careful with public private partnerships. Okay, now Governor McMaster recently called for the reopening of beaches. That's part of reopening America. We've got to have our beaches, right? I mean, you take a beach vacation every, what, month, Josiah? What about you, no. Stuart? Every... Oh, wait a second. Alex lives on a beach. So Alex, Alex is the one we should be, we should keep our, you know, he, he lives the beach style life right there in Florida. But anyways, do you, no, why, why did Governor- No, for me, hiking. Hiking, there you go. Just as good as the beach. Why did Governor Master call for the reopening of beaches? And this is from Ryan, knowing that the individual cities were planning to keep them closed regardless. That's Ryan. That's Ryan Thorne's question. And maybe does anybody want to answer that? I, well, I mean, was it was it to, he he put in here? Was it to avoid protests? Do you think that's why Governor McMaster called for the reopening of beaches? I, I would believe that. <laughs> I mean, I would believe that absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've asked, we've challenged um, some of the things that are going on with the checkpoints and so forth. And um, so we're working on that with the attorney general. And um, really, though, you know what? If the General Assembly, if the Senate and the House of Representatives would go into session, they could stop the executive orders. We can stop them. We've just got a, the, the Speaker of the House and uh, the President of the Senate have to call that session. And, um, and that's what, that's how we could stop all this. Yeah. So anybody else want to answer that? Well, I'll, I'll just speak to it real quick. The beaches are a big part of the state's economy. So, um, when we talk about the, you know, the way that people provide for their families in South Carolina, you know, the two biggest industries is agriculture and then tourism. So, um, so that is a way that, that, um, that a lot of people, uh, it's something a lot of people depend on is is the beach for sure. Okay. 
so we've went through a lot of the questions here. We're, we're, we've got 10 minutes left. I think there's going to be some millennials watching this. We may be the only millennials on this webinar because we're, we're patriot nerds, I guess, is what we could be called. <laughs> Former Ron Paul, what, what were we called? We were called Paul bots back in the day. Paul bots. <laughs> uh, so, but to the millennials out there that are our age, that are waking up, they're, 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 they're moving back in with their parents. You know, they're, they don't have jobs right now. They, they've believed in big government. They've listened to the, um, the, the, the mainstream media for all these years, and, and they've, they've believed the lies. And now we're experiencing, we're seeing the facts that the, this is no worse than the flu. So really the precedent is now set that we should close down our economy every September or October when the flu season begins. We, we, don't, we shouldn't do that. That's, that's against Americanism. What would you say to these millennials that are watching this? And you get it longer than a minute, uh, two to three minutes to answer this question. <laughs> Josiah, what would you say to these millennials that, that are not on our side yet, but offer, the, you know, offer them some words of wisdom, if you would? Sure. Well, um, I think it comes down to if you're, if you're looking for hope, um, you know, look to our American heritage. Look to liberty. And I think you'll find that the deeper you go in studying the solutions that liberty has to offer, um, the more hope there is there. And I think that, that you know, you got to look to the lessons of history. Um, we can't just make this up as we go along. We have to look and see that, um, that historically government have not, has not provided the answer. It's people working together. Um, that's something I tell a lot of young people when I talk to them is, you know, people have this idea that, um, getting in, involved in politics um, is a, uh, you know, just this sort of way to connive and gain control. And, you know, and it is so much of the time, but what it's supposed to be is a way of helping our communities, neighbors helping neighbors, people helping people. And we should be getting involved so that we get, so that we reduce that control, so that we reduce that power that the government is exercising so that people are free to do what God designed them to do, so that people are free to provide for their families. Those are all amazing things, and they allow for people to build their own solutions without government getting in the way. And so that's what I would say to millennials, to young adults, is um, you know, look at those lessons. Learn those lessons. Humble yourself. I know I have got to humble myself sometimes. Humble yourself and, and be willing to learn the lessons of history and – and I think you'll find that it's better to operate from a standpoint of love for your neighbor than of forcing your neighbor to do stuff using the power of government. Alex, your turn. Yeah, uh, thank you, Josiah. I got words of wisdom right there, and I agree completely. And, you know, being a millennial, I, I admit that I was incredibly deceived. Uh, by the time I graduated from high school, you know, deciding whether I wanted to, I, I didn't actually graduate from high school, but I got a GED. Uh, I was so far off into left field because I had been brainwashed and I believed that government was the solution to things and, uh, you know, didn't like God. But when you actually stop and think about it, you realize that stuff is so silly. So, I mean, part of it is just growing up and, and taking responsibility for yourself. Um, and, you know, I, I think I do have some sympathy for millennials, uh, not just because I am a millennial. In many ways, uh, millennials are being deprived of a lot of the blessings that our parents' generation had and their parents' generation had, uh, especially liberty. You know, in America today, to try to start a business, you know, you got to fill out who knows how many forms and pay who knows how many fees, and you got to hire attorneys and accountants and jump through 80 hoops and get a license to do this and a license to do that. Whereas my grandpa, he could just say, hey, I'm starting a business, you rent a piece of property and get started. Uh, and, you know, when you add to that the insane amounts of debt that the establishment has poured on our backs through no fault of our own, right? A lot of this happened before we were even born. Uh, you know, my kids now, this ridiculous stimulus thing, they just added $20,000 worth of debt onto the backs of each of my children. Um, you know, they didn't sign up for that. They're not responsible for that. And then you got suckered into getting these stupid university degrees that are worse than worthless. You know, you have a degree in gender studies and a $200,000 loan. Um, you know, we were deceived and, and we in many ways got the short end of the stick. And so I, I think there, there is some sense of sympathy there. But Feeling sorry for ourselves and, and lamenting about how bad we have it is not actually going to fix any problem. And so we need to, uh, you know, to, to be cliche, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, 
uh, recognize what our forefathers recognized. Liberty is incredibly valuable. It's worth fighting for. In fact, it's worth paying almost any price for. Our forefathers, they said, give me liberty or give me uh, death, right? That's how seriously they took this. And so we should look back to American history, real American history, not the fake version that they're peddling in the government's indoctrination centers masquerading as schools, not the fake version that they peddle on the History Channel or in the fake news, uh, and say, wow, you know, those people were willing to put their lives on the line for something that we no longer have. What can we learn from that? What can we do to regain that? Uh, I think it's going to be critical. And so I do have some sympathy, but, uh, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves is not going to fix anything. We've got to get serious. We've got to uh, throw off these shackles and, and change things if we want to have the same opportunities that our forefathers had. Stuart, go ahead. Well, Josiah and Alex knocked that one out of the park. So, um, but yeah, really it comes, I think millennials um, uh, and a lot of the generations after millennials are the education system, you know, the, uh, is, has a lot to do with, um, with the way things have gone. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you look at the situation we're in right now, I mean, going back to our, our founders of what they taught us about never trading our liberty for security. And um, there's a lot of politicians, there's a lot of people that will reference um, those teachings, that will reference those phrases, but how many of us actually are willing to, um, to put our neck out there and to, to literally to die for, um, for that sentiment, you know, for being a free American? Um, I think millennials in a lot of ways, too, um, they are... We, we have had to face and we are going to continue, future generations are going to have to continue to face this ever uh, surmounting debt. Um, soon it's going to be like over, I think, like 24, 24.5 trillion or, you know, something around there. So um, if we want freedom, if we want to be free and we want future generations to, um, to truly be free, then we have to take these sacrifices. We got to take these risks. And, and that's why I know Josiah is doing this. That's why I'm doing it. Evan's doing it. Alex is doing it. Um, we want future generations to have the freedom that our forefathers had. And so that's why we're fighting. Um, I would encourage any, any millennial or any young person um, that they're an individual. You know, I would tell them, uh, number one, and I have this talk with uh, a lot of young people, um, that they have an inherent God-given ability, God-given rights, um, that no government, no collective mob should be able to trample on or take from them. Thank you, Stuart. Last question. I, I know all of you read the New American Magazine. Josiah has been reading it since he was, what, 11, 12? 11 or 12. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Stuart, I know you've been getting New American Magazines before I even knew about the John Birch Society. <laughs> I'm now the one that's a field coordinator, so I have, I have the, uh, the honor of working for the society. Uh, do you recommend that everybody listening, you know, subscribe to the New American Magazine and consider joining the John Birch Society? I Go do. ahead, Josiah. Okay. Uh, are you, oh, sorry. What was, sorry, I misunderstood the question. Okay, the New American Magazine, do you recommend people reading it? Do you recommend people take the step to join the John Birch Society? Yes, I, yes, I do. And with this, I'm, I'm going to actually jump off. Um, but uh, I gotta, gotta go. But, um, but yes, I do recommend that. Very thankful for what uh, what JBS has been doing to be a a beacon of of light in uh, a lot of times the darkness of uh, you know providing the, the the real news. Thanks for and, remaining uh, with us, Josiah. I know you stuck with us longer than you you probably should have. Thanks for being it, with us, Josiah. It's a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex and Stuart. Okay. Alex, there. same question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I don't say that just because I write for the New American. When I was in college, I was despairing because I was writing for a publication owned by the New York Times. Like, I'm not going to do this. I guess I'll have to go into business. And then I found out that there was a such thing as the New American where the truth could be published. Uh, and that, that totally made my decade. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. It is, as far as I know, the best publication in the United States for getting the truth, getting the important information that you need to be able to preserve your freedom. Uh, John Birch Society is the only organization that has been resisting the deep state uh, for 62 years. So uh, if you're not involved yet, you know, we need people rowing, right? Just sitting in the boat is, is not helping. I know it's nice to, to be able to enjoy the freedom, but we need to fight to preserve freedom. And a very effective way of doing that is joining JBS, working with Evan, 
Um, and thank you so much for having me on the call. Evan, it's been such an honor. Thank you, Representative Jones. I can't tell you guys, all of you, how much I appreciate you and all the viewers and listeners out there. Um, you guys are amazing. Uh, just thank you so much for, uh, for staying with us and for giving us the opportunity to do this. And God bless you. Thank you, Alex. Stuart? Yeah, absolutely. So in, I want to say in 2007, when I was out on a road, probably holding signs for Ron Paul out there, a fellow pulled over in a pickup truck and he had a couple bins of this magazine and it was the new American magazine. <laughs> and I mean, he had, I don't know how many years he, he has given me years. I mean, probably decades back of the new American back into the eighties sometime, I want to say. Um, but uh, the new American magazine, I don't know of a better way to articulate and to get our message out there than the new American magazine. I have given it to so many people and, um, it's it is the best source of news for for our message um, for liberty for truth. Um, so I yeah, it's I would recommend anybody to read the New American Magazine and uh, join the John Birch Society. Thank you, Stuart. Well, everybody, that is the end of our session. This uh, has been a great webinar with uh, some special guests. Uh, we'll be on again on Thursday evening. We have a guest, Lucretia Hughes, and she'll be uh, part of the webinar on Thursday. We're calling these Birchinars. So if you receive a, a, a message from the Birchinar organization, that's, that's the organization that's going to send the email out for this. And then next Tuesday, we will have Alex Newman back on the show with Frank. I, I guess I could call this a show. It's, it's, it's a webinar, but we'll, he'll be on the, the webinar with Frank De Verona. Uh, a man that survived uh, the Bay of Pigs, and he's a true patriot out of Florida. So uh, anyways, please join us on Thursday evening and then, and then also on Tuesday evening. Anyways, I will have this posted on YouTube, and uh, I'll be sharing this with everybody. So thanks for watching this, and, and God bless all of you. Thanks, Evan. Bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. God bless you. See you, Alex.